Welcome to another episode of Rebranding Cannabis. We have uh, my good friend, Jason Gann, who I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, from the show, Wilfred. <laughs> this is Rebranding Cannabis. I'm your host, Jared Mursky, and you're listening to the show that helps the industry grow. Hear from industry titans, thought leaders, and the up and coming founders of this multi-billion dollar industry. Presented by Wick and Mortar. Uh, Jason Gann is, you know, much more than a comedian. He is also uh, a cannabis brand owner. Um, and what's cool about this brand is it's named after, well, the show, A Pot Smoking Dog. At last, a real reason to visit California. Wilfred Cannabis Pre-Rolls. Available in all good dispensaries. One of the cool things that I have to say, just to say it, um, Jason, I've been a fan of yours long before we met. Uh, as you know, I have a dog named Blazy. She doesn't smoke pot like you did on the show, but we are both fans of Wilfred. So um, welcome to Rebranding Cannabis, and thanks for joining me, man. Thanks, man. Thanks. It's good to see you. You too. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's, um, it's a bunch of little Blazies all over it. So... I got to ask, man, yeah, cool. when you, when you started, when you created the show, Wilfred, I mean, were you just smoking tons of weed while you were writing all the scripts and stuff? I mean, because that was one of yeah. kind of the first pop comics <laughs> I've seen. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, like when I, when we started, uh, it started as a short film way back at the end of 2001, like 19 years ago. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> um, and I did a lot of children's theatre for about 10 years and it, it, it killed me, you know. <clears throat> Three shows a day I'd be doing and uh, in and out all these different animal suits and uh, often high. And uh, and so when we come up with the concept, I kind of knew straight away what it was going to look like, you know, cause, and, and I wanted it to be a shitty dog suit that looked like it wasn't a lot of fun to be in. <laughs> I wanted him to have this kind of like <clears throat> attitude like he was stuck in his body that he, uh, he didn't want to be in. Okay. How many seasons did you guys do? It was four? Four in America. We did two seasons in Australia. It was a short film, two in Australia, four in America. Now how, 65 episodes all up. How did, did the, how did the Australian version differ from the American version, though? Oh, it, was, it was quite different. I mean, the one thing that was similar is the character, uh, the premise. Um, but it was a lot, well, it was more of a, a love triangle. Romantic love triangle. Um, American version was a buddy comedy, and it was redesigned deliberately in that direction. But I mean, the, in the in the premise of the train one, the guy comes home to this girl's place with a date, and it's her, it's her dog. So the action all takes place in her her house and in her life. So there's always, uh, whereas in the American one, it became more more about um, you know. Wilfred and Ryan, and, uh, and it became much more caught up in the existentialism of, uh, you know, mental health, and uh, it, it just, they're just very, very different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you know, in fact, when, this, when the American one started, there were, like, wars between Wilfred fans, you know, like, there's a lot of Aussies who were really, uh, a lot of Aussie fans were pissed off, and they were just like, you know, Wilfred's just Australian and, and Jason again selling out, doing it. And um, I used to say, you know, I could earn more money in McDonald's working for a year than I earned making uh, work making Wilfred in Australia on the network we're on. So, you know, if I'm selling out, if you, if you quit your first job ever, then you're selling out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you got to try and um, advance, you know, your life. So I took it to America and uh, we made a big, some big, Big changes, but I I I, I love it. I love the changes, and um, so, but yeah, cannabis was a big part of, even if subconsciously, it was a big part of uh, of, <laughs> of the show's content. Now, now, was it how long after the show was it that you decided, you know, hey, I want to start a cannabis brand and call it Wilfred Cannabis? Was this something that you had originally planned at some point during the show? Or was this something that uh, conspired <laughs> I afterwards? Wish, I wish I had. A, I wish I had. A, it would have been a lot more um, 
probably would have had, I, I could have taken advantage of, you know, a lot more momentum than I, than I had when I kickstarted uh, the cannabis thing. Um, and that's kind of what I was thinking, you know, I was like, man, that would have been a good time to, sh to show the brand, but. Yeah. Well, look, it, you know, you've got to jump through so many hoops to get any kind of uh, control over your own creations once you've, uh, you know, locked on, signed on with uh, multiple studios, uh, not, you know, more than one network even. And, uh, it's not just a simple matter of me deciding to do it and I can just do it. So it, it seemed like, um, it seemed like, I, I just didn't see, when Wilford finished, I was just looking at things beyond Wilford. You know, I just thought it was just over. And people would say to me in that final, you know, that towards the end of it, what are you going to do? I can't wait to see what you do next. Like, what do you? I'm like, look, I have no acting ambitions beyond Wilford. You know, if I, I'll do some shit. I'm a Shakespearean act. I played Hamlet when I was 22. I can always do acting if I want to, but I mean, Wilfred was fucking Hamlet in a dog suit. I mean, you don't, I mean, I'm never going to top Wilfred when it comes to my, what I, what I do and as a character. There's only one Wilfred, right? So I'm, why would I try, you know? So, but what I did try was making more television and as, as a show creator. And I, before the cannabis brand, I must have written five or six, um, so five or six projects to, you know, studios and networks that didn't get, didn't go to, series mm -hmm. so that was frustrating uh to be i was i was trapped in los angeles with i was i was i was chained to hollywood because that was all i've never known and yet i uh i wasn't getting in the door anymore you know i was i was getting in the door for for pictures i think i'll always be able to get pictures in hollywood and i was selling scripts but the chances of a show getting made from even selling a script, it's like the, a, a sperm making its way through the egg, you know, it, to get to that end is, is, is very rare. I realized that after Wilford, how rare it was uh, that Wilford was uh, on air and for as long as it was. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I wanted to also have, I mean, my, my wife's uh, from Spain. Uh, we've got two, two, uh, two, two sons and, we weren't spending any time with any family, you know. I had we had no family in America, and it was like uh, it was difficult. It was challenging. And I wanted to, uh, you know, I was really I wanted to have a career where I could live where I wanted to. You know, I was I was envious of like real estate agent. I don't know, that's that's right, but like a lawyer or something. You know, I could relocate and work there. You know, I couldn't relocate anywhere. I love LA, but I didn't. You know, I've been there for ten years, so I wanted to. Um, then I then the then the window opened for the cannabis thing. Now I I just put a I basically put, I wanted to test the waters and I put a joke ad out saying Wilfred's Wilfred's weed delivery service because I knew that you know obviously cannabis was legal in California where I was living and I just wanted to test what people's response would be if if I put that out. So I, I made this you know fake ad and I put it on the social media and everyone went kind of crazy and. You know, a, a couple of people, one guy in particular, reached out and said he's in the in the cannabis biz, business and that it could be a good opportunity. I thought I'd never get the rights to it um, from the you know studio, um, and I and he said it was worth asking, and I said yeah, and so uh, I did, and uh, I eventually um, got over the line, and so I was able to enter cannabis and hemp space. With the brand, so then I knew I had something. You know, then I I didn't know like I I, I didn't I didn't know how I was going to get there, and I really put you know the, the the cart before the horse. I knew that what my skills was in writing and creating something great. Uh, I think I'm pretty good at marketing now, but at, at the time I was just about you know, and I also think I'm creative now as an entrepreneur. But back then I was just creative as a storyteller and an actor, but I wasn't a good businessman. I've been ripped off my whole career. I've had, I, have, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't, I didn't have the, success, the financial success that you should have if you have a TV show that <laughs> goes to 35 countries. That's, that, let's put it that way. And so, and I didn't know how I was going to get it. And so um, I just thought I, I wish I could have something regular to do. Like I don't want to be just this, you know, actor in a castle writing stories like i want to and also you know, I, I come from a landscape gardening background you know i can i can you know 
dig trenches and build, put our irrigation systems in. But I, I didn't know about marketing, about business, about any, anything like that. So, so I made this commercial. I, 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 sold my, I sold my apartment that I bought with my Wilford money. I sold my apartment and I put some money into some uh, materials. I made, I, I produced a commercial, which was the Wolf of Canada uh, tourism ad. And I designed some, I uh, had some boxes designed, the packaging, and some um, marketing um, posters. You know, Wolf on the horse, sort of a <laughs> guy here, it's like Wolf uh, on a horse. And so I, and then I went to a place, I went to Canada, Mexico, um, down in Mexico. And, and it was there that I started to, um, as a guest, and it was there that I started to uh, show a human uh, set me up there, and I um, it was there that I met some you know potential future partners, and um, it's just been and, and you know and it's, I got to know every part of the, the business, you know, like I and, and mostly because we didn't have a budget, you know, I bootstrapped it the whole the whole way, didn't you know, like uh, just I did sales myself for the first ten. 10 dispensaries before um, we took on a sales team. And, and uh, yeah, it, it, I like to just got to know every part of the business. Yeah, I mean, this industry is hard. And now it's all I do. And yeah. I, 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 this industry I don't have any, I don't have any time for, like, sorry, go for it, yeah. Oh, I was just saying this industry is tough. You know, there's a lot of people that jump in thinking that, you know, they're going to make money right away and that weed still sells itself when that's not the case. Um, you know, even I, look, I, I like embarrassing. I did too. I did too, and I thought it would be like I thought it was just a slam dunk, really. And that, uh, and 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 the reason why I did it, actually did so much on my own, mate, was because so I had so many conversations with people that were we were going to do this and that and this and that, and and it just didn't happen. You know, mm -hmm. like it just wasn't happening. And I needed it to happen. Like I, but, but I needed it. So. Um, I had to succeed. And so that's when you start doing things yourself that you would normally pay people as individuals to do, you know? Yeah. I well, used to be, I used to get a pretty good wage. When I was on television, I had a pretty good wage. So if I wanted something done, I just put out my credit card and just paid for it. <laughs> but if you want to, you know, there'll be lots of people in the cannabis industry that will take your credit card, um, you know, and um, be consultants and you can, you can spend a lot of money, uh, you know, you can spend a lot of money setting up a cannabis brand that does. And what I discovered also is there's not a great amount of loyalty to um, celebrity brands. When it comes to weed, I know that I don't give a shit what your celebrity is. I want the best I can for the most economical price, which is why from the beginning I always wanted Wilfred Cannabis to be affordable, the best quality it could be. A bit affordable and and our, and pre rolls are like they're 100 percent flour. So there's and there's no trim. So it's it's like and I wanted to keep as low as possible the price as affordable as possible. So my mm -hmm. my margin is very small in pre rolls, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but the pre rolls are kind of like the the signature item, you know. They're our they're our mantelpiece kind of item. Mm -hmm. and so. Uh, we've had some big setbacks. We've had some big setbacks. And, uh, I mean, just before COVID happened, I mean, now we're focusing on brand licensing. Well, we're about to enter into um, Colorado. But now mm -hmm. we are we're about to. But we were also about to enter Michigan, Washington State, and um, and uh, Nevada. And we had contracts with partners that were – you know, we were sifting through, started like, sifting through contracts, but, but, but that all just been put on uh, hold, you know, mm -hmm. with uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. I was also about to um, start putting Wilfred in that live um, MC at festivals, uh, cannabis events and stuff like uh, um, Cannabis Cups and just start doing some stand-up as, uh, as Wilfred and really raise his, raise the profile of the character again by doing just hitting the road doing what i started out doing actually which is live live comedy and then once i've seen the i've seen the writing on the wall it was coming you know over here in spain but i saw it right before it even you know i don't know the very early the very early signs of covid i knew it was coming and i 
just change direction. Just put the whole like lighting on hold. So it's just pointless now. So I've just you just have, I've just got to pivot the the company and um, yeah, just to make it survive. So it changes all the time. So you're in Spain right now. You're with your wife and kids. Your wife's from Spain. She's she seems like she's been a huge supporter as have your kids with respect to the new brand that you've launched because I think for two reasons a you get to spend a lot more time with your family and and b she's probably pretty excited that you're you're doing something new and something that you love uh, that also ties into what it was you were doing in the past and that's the show so this seems like honestly the best path forward with respect to what you're trying to do with your career anyways. Um, because again, it gets you, it gives you yeah, the, it gives well, you the ability to tie in your, your, you know, your comedy side and your brand. Now you mentioned earlier celebrity brands, you know, and I have a thing about that and that's, you know, most celebrity brands fail and that's because they try to leverage too much of their own personal likeness um, in hopes that uh, consumers um, will will buy that brand. I mean, you look at Chong's Choice, Marley's Naturals, Willie's Reserve, um, uh, Leafs by Snoop, um, all 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 great companies, um, good brands, but their sales aren't nearly as well as well other brands that are in the cannabis space that produce perhaps more craft like products. That's not to say, though, of course, that these brands can't be um, much bigger, better, and stronger. Um, but at the end of the day, what I like that you've done differently than them is it, the brand isn't called Jason Gant, right? The brand is called Wilfred. So Wilfred is its own character in and itself. So it's not necessarily like those other brands I mentioned, but it's actually in a category of its own. Um, so I think that's really cool. And I think that's something that yeah. also makes you really unique. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, my wife, I'm, I mean, I got my wife because of Wilfred and my, my kids are Wilford babies, so yeah. I mean, they can't they can't be too uh, they can't like, hate Wilford too much. But as they grow <laughs> up, or they they wouldn't exist if it wasn't Wilford, right? So yeah, um, yeah. They they <laughs> well, let's call it Daddy Pun Sticks. They said Daddy the, that, Daddy's comes with Pun Sticks. They don't know we, they still don't know what cannabis is. You know, they just the word to them. You know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. they're seven and five. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it's um well the thing about Celebrity brands, I think, is that um, cannabis is. I mean, even if you got a celebrity brand, say you got, I don't know, I don't know who's the celebrity. I mean, George Clooney's vodka, right? Let's yep. George Clooney's vodka. Are you going to buy because of George Clooney? I mean, I don't think it, people. I think people are happy for these um, celebrity brands to exist. No one's saying, "Oh, look, I don't care about celebrity brands." I, should, I mean, what, who doesn't love Tommy Chong? I mean, and who doesn't love the Tom, Tom's Choice as a brand? Um, but if you think about beers, just think about beers for a second, right? You might have you're going to have your favorite beer, and and it doesn't and it's not it doesn't matter who they get to have it. might make a, a effect if if I love if I love drinking kind of beers, and they get you know an actor who I hate on there promoting it, then I may go away from them. But hands up, if I love that beer, I love the flavor, and I stick to it. Cannabis is a little bit different because <laughs> all cannabis is good, you know. It's, it's just how, how good it is. So for me, I don't think that there's, and it's also so hard to be consistent. And a lot of a lot of brands will, you know, claim that they're, you know, they're consistent and that they're tasty. I personally, I smoke a lot of weed and have for a quarter of a century, but I couldn't tell the difference between brands by their box or their name when it comes to smoking cannabis. Mm-hmm. And my relationship with cannabis is a spiritual relationship, right? So when I smoke cannabis, it's like, here's my girl, you know. And so I, I, I guess, I guess, I, I guess, me, me personally, I'm not dragged to, um, to branding so much. But here, we, here but to Wilfred, you know, I'm, I got, I got, I love the business. I feel like I'm creating history in a sense. I mean, what I did with Wilfred as, a, as a short film was hadn't reached. No Australian short film had had that kind of success. The television was the same. The television show in Australia, the American show. I mean, fucking Robin Williams was in it, man. Robin Williams asked to be in it, and and it was his first TV show he did since Mork and Mindy. The show affected people. 
for me to come off my chain to come to America and do that uh, was very was very special little little comet that I was on, and I was aware of there was something special. For it to be over is very sad. For it to live a life again through through this brand is something that I could not have possibly imagined even in any kind of parallel universe situation. I mean, weed is still illegal in Australia where I'm from, mm -hmm. and I didn't even imagine weed, weed ever being recreational legal, let alone uh, having the possibility of having a, a brand myself. So just by doing it, I felt like I already won, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not making a huge amount of money yet. One day I hope it does. But it, but but that's that's not money isn't isn't really the the driving force of this. I feel like I'm doing I'm creating a piece of history and uh, I want Wilfred the brand to live way beyond me. We talked before you and I about uh, the day coming where I'm like, oh, I'm done with Wilfred. I'm holding Wilfred audition. And and I'll and then people can send their Wilfred auditions and, and it'll be like Ronald McDonald. When Ronald McDonald, the first Ronald McDonald quit, they replaced him with another Ronald McDonald, Colonel Sanders. You know, so I'm trying to create a brand now that is a lot. Uh, so Wilfred doesn't he doesn't speak as much, if you notice, in, in, in the stuff that I'm doing. I'm doing some stuff at the moment as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not speaking at all. I really want to try and create a kind of a Marlboro Man kind of mystique about him. That's, Dos uh, that's, the you know, Dosaki sky, right? We talked you know, about, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But it's a lot of fun. And, and yeah, I mean, the kids, we recently shot something on a beach here and we shot it on, on, on my iPhone. And my, my wife was the, was the, DO, the DOP, the DP, and, I, and, um, and my kids were, uh, because it's COVID, right, we don't trust anyone babysitting them, right, even, even my, my grandparents right now, right? So yeah. we don't, they're here with us all the time. No pipe. Did you lose me? No, I didn't lose you. All right. So, no. so we got, we're on this beach on this beach we got a, a umbrella with my kids underneath it with the ipads the only thing to keep them busy you know out, totally out of their hair with like snacks and air and esky with, with food and drinks and tool and towels and lots of stuff in this little kind of uh you know this little like, almost rabbit warren and we're over shooting and but that, and that was our and that was our base unit you know so but it looks fucking amazing it looks amazing and so we got it for zero dollars but you know they're used to me getting in the dog suit now, walking around, you know, you know, setting up shots and stuff like that. In the old days, with Wilfred, obviously, um, you know, I had people go like shit for me. Uh, whereas now, um, I kind of do everything. You do. I've got partners that help with other areas, and stuff, but you know, when it comes to creative, uh, I'm driving. Well, and that's and that's really set you up for success as it relates to business because having to have having to how do I want to say this? Having had to do so many different things uh, in relation to the business and, 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 you know, you're, and you're producing your series. I mean, that's a lot of work. And I'm sure that by doing all of those things, it really set you up for success with respect to how you now approach your, your cannabis brand. But what I want to know, Wilfred, or should I say Jason, um, <laughs> is, uh, did you smoke a lot of weed actually on the show? Were you, were you smoke? Was, were you in, actually, were you in Elijah Wood smoking? Was he actually, was he blazing with you? <laughs> no, 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 sadly, sadly, that's a disappointing answer for a lot of people. But ah. um, like when I, Wilford was a, Wilford was a short, but I wrote, but I wrote it high. I mean, I wrote, you know, I wrote it, all the co-wrote with Adam, uh, you know, all the, all the episodes of, uh, of, of the Australian series and I made it point to be high throughout the entire writing process right I did other shows in Australia created I wasn't high at all but for that I wanted to be mm -hmm. when it came to shooting it was different because I the first short film I did was a, a character called Mr. Dan who was similar to Wilfred in, in his kind of attitude and style and he was he was ripping bombs during a job interview that he was actually holding and uh I used to have to fall on the sofa again and again. My, my buddy's shooting and he said, I didn't believe it, didn't believe it. Eventually, I, I slammed my head into this big brick. I split my head open while I was shooting. I cussed myself and finished the, the shoot. But I learned a lesson that day. You know, 
don't be smoking a lot of weed while you're shooting. And and so that was that was a small budget. But when you suddenly got you know you got a million dollar per episode, I don't know. I think um, I wonder how many how many millions? I think it was like two hundred thousand dollars per episode. The Australian one started as, and then when you when you got that much money and equipment ticking over, you can't afford that, you know. And you just need to so. When it came to the actual shooting of Wilfred, it wasn't until I did something with uh, Tom, Tommy Chong, Tommy Chong's crew actually really down there with, them. and they did this. Uh, uh, yeah, I did a little thing with Tommy Chong, a little grab for the for their uh, those guys. But with their with the guys um, that were doing it, I shot this little uh, sketch, and it was you know, Wilfred smoking through one of those bones, dog, like bones that they, you buy from the pet store. Yep. Drilling with the grill. And, uh, oh, that's a great like, idea. Why have I never thought of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I thought it was great too, you know. I, th- I, thought we, I thought we did it all. We didn't do that. And so then um, it wasn't until I was getting really high in the dog suit shooting that that I went, I said to everyone, I said, hey, I just got to say, this is the first time I've actually been fucking totally high as Wolford in this dog suit, right? It's the first time ever. Uh, I mean, obviously, when I was shooting in Australia, after we'd finished, I'd go home and, and blaze up, of course. But when it was when it came to actual time to being switched on, like when the, when there's a lot of money involved, um, no, we, we never we never were. Mm-hmm. I think one of the beautiful things about the cannabis industry that I've recognized is that it's an opportunity for you to like do business and be yourself. And that's why it's so much fun that, uh, or that's why it's, yeah, that's why it's so much fun to see so many people in the cannabis industry at these conferences, just getting absolutely baked because the conversations you have with people at that point are, it's just, it's a whole nother, it's a whole nother lifestyle. It's not even, it's not even just a completely different industry. It is a way of living for some of these people, yeah, it, including myself. Like, I smoke weed every day, all day, and it doesn't affect me at all um, negatively. Yeah, it's like one big awesome outdoor music festival from the 90s or something where, uh, I mean, I actually met you at Hall of Flowers. Uh, and then uh, yep. I was there. I, did, I, went around the, I went around as Wilford. I remember. For a while, like, for my friend. And... Uh, at one point, I walked past. I was with. I walked past with a couple of kind of, uh, you know, people, chaperones. I walked down this ramp outside of a building outside towards another building, and there was this just three people there having a conversation. Uh, and this girl just walked. She was talking <laughs> in the middle of the sentence. She saw me, and during the sentence, she went, "Well, friend," <laughs> I couldn't believe it. it was like, and she, and then you could tell. I mean, I can tell when I'm seeing a fan who really is a Wilford fan, right? You just, you just know. And she was, and she was, she was just completely, um, just dumbstruck. And not only that, then I was able to pull out a packet of, uh, pull out a packet of Wilfreds, and uh, and just pa- pass her one, you know, just pa- pass her a, a pre roll, which I knew were, were great pre rolls as well. She just couldn't believe it, you know, and and so um, that was a really exciting and, and on that a lot of that on that day, and that was a pretty awesome um, to think that this was the end where the industry. But I was working, you know, that was the job, the job, and I was smoking, getting high with Wilfred fans, and I was as well in the car in, in the suit. That's so funny. Uh, that's that's great, that though. Voice, when you when you bring that much joy to someone, it's like uh, Wilfred un- taps into some child within people. Uh, taps into some, and now, uh, and you mentioned the difference between the two shows. I'd have to say the American show started a lot more conversations about mental health than the Australian one ever tried to. It dealt with a lot of issues like depression and stuff. That I get, I get messages on Instagram every, every day. From people from all over the world who just tell me how much the show helped them, and so that to me is like uh, that's an honour to begin with. Um, and the fact that I'm why I'm very also very careful and selective with what I do with the brand that I don't damage that. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't damage what 
will for many people that I maintain that artistic credibility. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I mean, because I always said about Wolf of the TV shows, like, there's one more to it than just me and the dog suit cracking jokes. Mm-hmm. You know? Wolf could get very silly very fast. And when we did the seven minute short film, a lot of people said this could not last beyond seven minutes. It's just the, the, the idea just doesn't. Doesn't can't go that far, and I said they're wrong. But then when we did the pilot, they said the same thing. It's a great pilot, but where could the series go? And then we they said this, they said the same thing after the American pilot as well. Yeah, it's a great pilot, but what's going to happen? Is it a series? Well, it's almost twenty years, you know, nineteen years since uh, we did the short film, and the characters still around, and people still love the characters much now as when we did that first short film. So you know, it's great to be part of that, something like that. Yeah, I mean. It's interesting you bring that uh, up mental health. My friend, Rachel Wolfson, um, on Instagram, she goes by Wolfie Comedy. Um, <clears throat> she has a uh, podcast, actually, called um, Chronic Relief. And, it's, and it's, uh, it's a podcast between comedians who actually all they talk about is mental health. Apparently, comedians, um, uh, a majority, or, or so it's said, <laughs> Uh, uh, as data shows, they a lot of them actually have mental health issues, which is um, why they use comedy as an escape to feel or from feeling the way they feel. And it also provides, I guess, a lot of ammo, as you will, with respect to the sketches that these comedies are doing. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, so I just wanted to give her a shout out because I think she's doing an amazing job um, yeah. creating a conversation around something that's important. And more importantly, mental health as it relates to cannabis, which I think is also cool because that's something that you took, I think, as a part of your show's brand DNA and integrated into the Wolfie, into the, uh, sorry, Wilford Cannabis brand. And, and that's genius because, um, you know, most brands that come to the cannabis industry, they don't really have much of a story. And most of the leadership involved in a lot of these brands, because they have different stories from different places because they come from different walks of life. It's really hard to kind of develop a, a, a neutral ground for which the brand, for which the foundation of that brand stands on as the story relates to the uh, consumer market. Right. So you have a really interesting piece. Mm. Now, when um, uh, mm. we, we talked a few weeks ago uh, or was it a month ago, fuck, I don't know. It's been a, this, this whole COVID thing is like speeding time up and slowing it down in all sorts of ways, but we were talking about this really yeah. cool, this really cool idea you had. And it was about, um, Wilfred giving back to pet shelters. Uh, and for, uh, well, let's talk a little bit more about that. Tell me, tell me kind of, and everyone else, how you were thinking you wanted to build that as it relates to the brand and, and kind of your social responsibility. About the pet shelters? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, uh, remember, remember I, we were talking about, I mean, maybe we were both super stoned. I'm sure we were, actually. Um, well, let, well, let, I mean, well, I mean there was, you, you covered a lot of ground in that. So let me just go back to, um, firstly, uh, the Chronic Relief um, podcast. I mean, yeah, shout out to your friend. I'd, I'd be happy to be involved in that at some point if you want everyone to reach out and uh, talk about it. I'll link it. you guys. Uh, you know, mental health is, yeah, is a, is a, big, is a big thing. A big thing for me, and it's been <laughs> for, for 25 years. You know, I mean, talk about suffering from depression. Uh, yeah, I still don't feel comfortable talking about it because for many years there's been a huge stigma with it that was almost like a deal breaker when it came to uh, you know your career. You know, it could, it could kind of be uninsurable, I guess, and it, it could damage damage your career. But um, I did also. When we did Wilfred, mate, my life was so out of control. I used to call, I used to call Wilfred a comedy. Because as far as I know, I coined that term because in the Australian one is when I call that, the emotional trauma was happening to these people, these characters, who weren't emotionally tra- traumatic scenarios that I'd ever seen on TV before. And we were dealing with, with um, this trauma in a way, with a dog and a sign of dog suit. And it just made it just, because I say about where my comedy came from is in life, why I'm a comedian is when shit gets so bad that you have to laugh at it. You have to laugh because if you don't, you're just, 
looking back, you know, and so um, when I, in the 90s, we played for Wilfred, I used to live the Seinfeld, 30 minutes a day, it was like 7 o'clock every night in Australia, and for that 30 minutes of the day, the dark clouds of depression parted for me, and then life was okay. And then as soon as that came in at the end, the dark clouds came back of a depression that I couldn't define or explain. It was just there. And it was, you can talk about it being chemical. I don't think it was chemical. I think it was soul. I think it was spiritual. It was a soul depression. And it was like, I used to think if I could forget, if I could make people forget about their miserable, stinking fucking lives for half a day, half an hour a day, not stinking fucking lives, I don't mean that disrespectfully, but I mean their pain, that that was the most, that's the most, the best thing I could ever do on this planet, right? So to, to have people now contact me and say that I help them get through mental health issues is the, is the, is the ultimate goal for me. I'd like to also, you know, be able to pay my bills. But that is, to be able to be able to affect people in that way was, uh, was significant. So when it comes to, so, 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 but a lot of these things you realize, you know, the artist and the, and the musician, the musician and the, and the, and the song, the, the creator, the writer, and the, the, the book, the work, the prose, you don't often don't know what you're writing. You often, you might think you are, but the, the most great things that, that people would say about Wilfred now that seem to be by design, many times they weren't. Many times they were just, it was fluke, you know. It was just instinct. Just telling a story. Yeah, no, it's good. As far as the uh, as far as the animal shelter, as far as the animal shelter stuff thing, thing mate, I think it was actually your idea, and it's, it's a great idea. <laughs> but yeah, so I I, I can't extrapolate to. But my idea far, came from you. Right. <laughs> there you go. It was organic. It was. You look the whole the whole world of things being organic. You couldn't you couldn't contrive. You couldn't design the world of journey. And you know, even back when I was just an actor writer. I used to sometimes speak with writers or whatever, and they'd want to know how you did it, and you just couldn't, you couldn't replicate it, and you, and I wouldn't, you wouldn't want to, because you know Wilfred the character came from a lot of fucking pain, man, and I hated playing Wilfred in Australia. I used to hate being in that dog suit, and my American manager when he caught when he caught we were going to do a different show in America, and he called me up and he said, look, I know you don't want to do Wilfred again. I said, I'm not getting that fucking dog suit again. And this is this is this is a story that I'd like to share. So I, because I, so anyway, no one knew when I shot Wilfred. No one knew Wilfred. It wasn't like I was walking down the street and people would be like, "Hey, Wilfred!" You know, they'd just be like, people would be giving me shit or whatever. You know, people would be like, "What's this fucking clown doing?" Mm -hmm. So I didn't, didn't do a lot for my self esteem being a Wilfred Australia. And then when I signed onto the show in America, because what I said to him was, he he. I, he said to me, I think this could be your neck, your Mork and Mindy, you know. <laughs> this could be your Mork and Mindy, like Robin Williams, you can design. You, you, yeah, everyone's going to remember the dog. Everyone remember the alien. You can design your career. I said, look, Mork and Mindy is my favorite show. If you can get, if you can sell the show, I'll do it. He sold it. I did it. Robin Williams ended up being in it, and he ended up being his first TV show since Mork and fucking Mindy. So can you believe the synchronicity of that? That I had made that decision to come to America with the show because of the, the carrot of this could be on Mork and Mindy, and now Mork's on my fucking show, right? But so the first day of the publicity shoot, I turn up, first time I ever had my own trailer. In Australia, I didn't ever have my own trailer. You know, I'd share it with everyone. With the crew, everyone would be coming in, taking, you know, leads out of bags, and that would be my trailer, right? Well, in America, suddenly I'm in this trailer. Just for, just for photo publicity shots, and I, I walk in and I see Wilfred hanging there, right? He's on the fucking, uh, he's hanging there on coat hanger. And I got hit with this wave of depression because the suit represented for me 10 years of being uh, doing children's theatre, 30 bucks a show, and all those difficult years in the 90s of suffering severe depression. And, and I, and I, but I also knew. It made people feel good, so I was conflicted. But I remember thinking at the time, I don't think I can get in this dog suit one more fucking time, like not once. How I've just signed on for six seasons, 13 episodes per season. 
And I, I really thought, can I just jump in my car and drive across America and let's let them fucking catch me and throw me out of the country and just don't turn up? Just don't turn up. Maybe I could do that. I got down on my knees. I got down on my knees and I said out loud, please, God, help me find a way to love this. Nothing happened then. I went out. I did the first photo shoot set up, and it's a kind of famous one. People will see if they just press Google Wilfred, you'll see me leaning out of the car window going, ah, like yelling <laughs> out of car window. I had a fan going there. The one was totally nice, right? I remember that one, actually. <laughs> but my heart, I, I felt like I was dying then because I just thought like I was about to make the biggest fool of myself in front of, it wasn't bad enough, I just made a fool of myself in this dog suit in front of Australians, but now I'm about to do it to the whole world. This show could be a, a dog. This show could <laughs> bomb, and it's, I'm here I am dressed like this, and all this pain. I finished it. Everyone was nice. Thanks, Jason. Go back into your trailer, grab some snacks, relax for a while. We'll let you know when you've got the next setup. Well, I, I, as I get out, I see this guy come up to me, and he said to me, and he was an Australian guy on Venice Beach, and he said, Mate, I, I just saw you. I didn't know you're doing this over here. I have over here on holidays. I walked down. I see you doing this. Mate, it's fucking up. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep going. You make a lot of people happy. You make so many people happy. Keep going. And that was my, that was it, man. That was your ah moment. On my knees, I prayed. Help me love this. And I, from that moment on, every time I didn't feel like getting in the show, every time I want to get in the suit during the season, I like look at it and I go, fuck. Remember the people out there who will who love Wilfred, who it affects in that profound way, and I and I and I did it, you know, gladly and lovingly. Man, that's great. And I still and now when I put it on, I put it on for Tommy Chong for that for that Tom, Tommy Chong four twenty thing. Now when I put it on, let me tell you, it's like a fucking great honor, and it, and and Wilfred is kept so well. It's like a ceremony, man. And when I take him out, it's like, uh, and I put it on, it's like, uh, it is a great, um, it's a very special relationship I have with that suit. How many because of those suits do you have left? Is, isn't, isn't. How many of those suits do you have left? Just one? I've got, I got one. Well, I've got one American one, and I've got the original Australian. Well, I was going to say, what you yeah. could do is you could, you could uh, they, there's this movie theater in Seattle. Um, yeah. And uh, it's owned by, um, not Bill Gates. Um, God, why am I having a brain fart? Paul Allen. Uh, and this movie theater, it's got all of the original. He, he's like, cause he's, he's a, he's a collector of um, old movie costumes. So he has like one of the original Superman costumes. And anyways, so he puts them throughout his different movie theaters. And so what I was thinking would be kind of cool is if you took one of yours from Australia and you put it into a glass case, you could actually put that in different dispensaries for like 60 days or a month and allow them to use that as an attraction item to build the brand. That could be dope. Just saying, you know, since we're, since we're on the call yeah. and, you know, I mean, you got, you got your one, you got your one. Well, that's also true, but it's uh, if, if the dispensary is willing to pay for it, it could be a good, good point of sale display for 60 to 90 days in a dispensary. Yeah, well, I don't know what You've been, I don't know what dispensers you've been dealing with, but uh, you know they don't, they don't really have a they don't splash around too much, too much money. They want the best deals they can get. Look, I I I, just, I went around from dispensary to dispensary <sighs> and sales, and I never done sales in my life. And I was walking around with a Wilford t-shirt, Wilford hat on. I walk in. Some places were like, I knew I was a sales guy. They weren't interested. Others were interested, but still getting our products on their shelf is another matter. I'd say every every dispensary is like its own Game of Thrones. You know, it's its own gatekeepers, its own <laughs> you know cutthroat <laughs> politics, and it's like just getting your just getting these damn three rolls on the on the shelf. To me, is like every time I get a, is a massive victory. But it's also what I love about California cannabis industry. I assume it's it's like this everywhere. It's real camaraderie. There's a real once you're in there, you're in like those the, the 25 shops that I'm in now. I consider them my friends and they're my partners, you know. And I, 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 I want to, I want to get to know them as, as well as I can because behind every one of those dispensaries is a story of overcoming adversity. 
And I've overcome a lot of adversity in my life to get where I've got. And so every, every single dispensary owner, they're creating history too. They're creating a history in a, in a more like traditionally American life. We're going to the West and we're gonna, we've got a, a pick and a, and a map and we're going to try and dig some gold here, you know, and we may, we may not make it. We may not all make it back alive. And now we're out here and it's, it's COVID and it's a, it's a, what is it called? A, an essential, it's an essential item and, and people that, you know, people are selling it. These stores are selling it with their masks on and it's a, it's a serious business. People's health, people, every time someone is going to have a transaction, they could die. Mm-hmm. So, uh, being in the cannabis game, man, it's, uh, it, I'm very proud to be in it. Very proud to be in it. Well, Jason, what I love about you is you, you're a humble person. Uh, I mean, when I met you at the hall of flowers, you were just, you were, you were very approachable. And to the point you made about the dispensary owners, you and I became pretty good friends right away too. Um, and, and I love that about you, you know, but more importantly, I think what others enjoy about your hustle and your grind is the fact that, you know, you made a comment earlier, you, you know, you, you pay people to do shit for you that you don't want to do. But in this instance, you were like, fuck it. I'm going to do all of this myself. I'm going to learn the business. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to meet the people. I'm going to understand the industry and I'm going to show consumers, patients, bud tenders and business and other industry owners alike why Jason Gann, you know, loves the plant, believes in the plant and wants to support this industry. And, and that man is a beautiful story, you know? So I really Thanks, appreciate well, that about you. You know, I, uh, and it's one of the things about cannabis that is still hard to, I mean, anyone who grew up in these, you know, these, our eras, um, who remembers, who's going to always remember cannabis prohibition, um, they're never really going to be able, they're always going to have that stigma of like, I'm doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's probably going to take the longest um, to educate and to change that kind of mindset that cannabis as a, as a medication is, uh, and, and is something that recreational, something that makes you feel good, is, is doesn't have to be a bad thing, you know? That, yeah. Um, you know, people would say with depression, uh, if you if you're um, you know in the halls, the AA rooms, they'll they'll describe it as self medicating. And uh, but it's self medicating, yeah. But it's also but it's said in a not a patronizing way, but in a in a victim way. Yeah, you're self medicating because you need to be medicated because you're you're ill and there's something wrong with you. And with I think you can self medicate without it being that. You failed in some way. Mm-hmm. You failed some sanity test, or you failed some way that you need to soldier on and not, you know, not want to, not want to get high now. And 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 now you're high. Yeah, you, ha- you know, you were crying a minute ago, and now you're high and you're laughing. <laughs> Life is so fucking hard, and we're on this fucking planet. What's wrong with that? Nothing. You know, <laughs> it's like it's. You know, I think I think it all. It all goes back really, uh, Jason, to, you know, prohibition and why, why cannabis was made illegal in the first place. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, politics involved, uh, you know, people wanted to, you know, mill paper and, or I'm sorry, mill trees and, and use that to create fiber and paper and all of these other materials, um, as well as, you know, plastics and things of that nature to develop rope. So nylon and, and, and it really eliminated uh, the need for the use of this one plant that was and has been, uh, you know, on this planet for thousands of years. I mean, there was a, there was, you know, some study that I saw uh, on, I think it was CNN. That's real news or not, but <laughs> um, they found, uh, you know, THC, and frankincense residue uh, near uh, burial grounds where they would hold, um, you know, various different uh, uh, engagements. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, Tell me about that. yeah, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how far back it goes from 
both a ritualistic perspective, medicinal perspective, obviously wellness, and then of course, recreational. You know, I think for a lot of us, um, including myself, and I'll admit this, you know, on this podcast right here, right now, when I got into the cannabis industry, I completely bullshitted my way through to get my green card. I had no medicinal issues, right? I lied. I totally lied. But I think a lot of people did. And I mean, no disrespect to those who do actually, in fact, have medicinal issues as it relates to use to cannabis. But, uh, you know, I totally lied. And um, uh, however, I'm glad I did because it introduced me to the opportunity to try all of these different strains. And, um, you know, that was an interesting awakening because what I recognized and realized later on is that the strain specificity uh, really played um, a role in helping me understand the, the variety of um, uh, experiences or medicinal modalities that these, uh, you know, th- that this plant has. And so um, that was then, you know, really my opportunity to come in and, and rebrand the cannabis industry from, from a storytelling to an aesthetic perspective. And, and so I guess my question for you, Jason, is, you know, when you chose your strains for your brand, Wilfred, um, why did you choose those strains? And is there anything particularly interesting about the genetics that you have that differ from other brands? Well, look, I would like to be able to talk about strains a lot, a lot, a lot more, be a lot, a lot more informed than I, than I am. Um, I just am like a, uh, if it smells good, but look, we our our flower comes from Yolo Family Farm in um, just outside of Sacramento, yep. Yolo County, and uh, and and basically those the farmers there just gave me uh, a bunch of samples, <laughs> and I smoked it all, and it was really hard to choose, <laughs> but I just chose the best ones, the ones the best ones that I could, you know, and and yeah. uh, and there wasn't a bad one in them, so I. I uh, as long as I it, as long as I like it and it, it's smooth and it's uh, you know it. I mean uh, the reason why I went to um, sun, sun grown outdoor versus uh, versus um, indoor was just couldn't afford indoor. It was just too expensive. It was like when I tried to answer when I tried the first partner I I wanted to go into partnership with it was like two thousand dollars a pound. I'm like, okay, there's no business. There's no business here. There's just no. I would have to. There's just like zero margin there for me, or I'd have to ask. So, I and so I was talking to um, Jared Kylo actually at the higher Park, mm-hmm. and he was like, you know, very generous with time. And he said to me, "You considered, you know, outdoor, like it's like cheaper, and it's, you know, it can be really good and really good for pre roll." I'm like, well, okay, there's maybe another opportunity. Because the first, you know, partner I almost went into, it was like I would have been, you know, had more space over everything, but I wouldn't have made anything at all. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so that's when I started looking into that. And then it was a matter of, well, I mean, the THC percentage in these uh, pre rolls, you know, mine are in uh, mid to late twenty, and there, and and a lot of I knew, I also discovered a lot of pre roll, a lot of companies that had many many SKUs. Used all that shit and uh, all the crap and uh, and all, all of the um, leaf and stuff in their pre rolls, biomass type stuff. And so uh, I didn't want to do that. And so um, I wanted to try and create a, some, some trust. <laughs> I, I say, Wilfred, a high you can trust. So I wanted to, I wanted to just have a quality product that uh, and I, that, that was affordable. And that and that meant it had to be affordable for me too. So if if we can't afford to buy the flower because it's just, I mean, I, I look, I love looking at the photos on Instagram. I mean, all those when you close up of that of the flower and all the beautiful colours and all the those little drops of all those little dew drops and all that like magic. Mm-hmm. Of course, I love, I love smoking all that, but some of that stuff uh, we just can't afford. We're not, a, we're not, but that's not why we're trying to be, you know? Well, and I think the, and Jason, the, the important thing to understand too, and this is a huge misconception uh, as it relates to cannabis brands uh, and just in consumers alike, 
just because pot is grown outside doesn't mean it's less quality. Yeah. So no, well, to me, to me, it made. I, I love the idea of it, of it of it touching the sun because you know, like uh, it was. It just feels so organic. You know, well, like it just feels so natural the way nature intended. And and you know, and so I got like I love I love indoor as well. But yeah, I, I <laughs> dude. From where I come from, it was it, I was in heaven. Well, yeah, and look, I'll, I'll explain kind of the, this as an example, right, uh, as it relates to Wilford and um, the brand. And so when, I'm looking, when I look at um, the uh, outdoor-grown cannabis, if you think about it, so we did a documentary on uh, Humboldt County, right, and the growers. And so um, if you go to ahumboldtstory.com, you can watch it. It's a 20-minute documentary. But what we wanted to share was the fact that just because product – or rather flower is grown outdoors doesn't necessarily deem it as, as less quality, right? So um, it, it's got regen in Humboldt. There are, you know, what's called uh, regenerative farming techniques, um, dry cultivation techniques. You've got microclimates, you know, it's got this appellation, right? Much like, you know, wine country. And so when you look at the, um, the way that it's grown uh, and by the people that are growing it who have, mind you, years and years and years and years and years of experience, uh, much more than, you know, many of the cultivators that exist today, um, you know, they're growing just much better flower because it's also in smaller batches. So they're able to give, you know, each plant far more love and attention, right? Um, yeah. and, and when you look at that, uh, as it relates to, you know, the alcohol industry, right? You look at um, Everclear, it's 100 proof and it tastes like shit and you're going to be hung over as fuck. But then you look at Belvedere and that's a much smoother vodka. It's more expensive and it's less potent. So why would I pay less yeah. for less? So potency at the end of the day doesn't necessarily dictate quality, right? Um, it's the terpenes and cannabinoids and and the way it was grown and how it was grown and the soil it was grown. And, and so, um, you know, there's, uh, there's substance there. And I think that's a huge misconception as it relates to how cannabis is sold in dispensaries, you know, bud tenders, not all, but a lot have this misconception that again, you know, potency is, um, you know, uh, all that matters. And that's just not the case. Yeah. I mean, you can, well, look, I discovered years ago um, that you don't you need a remarkably small amount of cannabis to hit that receptor in your brain for you to be in the, the zone, right? Where what I where I what I describe as that spiritual connection. Like right? for me, being high is as much of a place as it is a feeling. So I'm in the same place, but it's it's all somehow uh, different, and mm -hmm. I like it. So I discovered that years ago, when I I mean many years ago, I'm talking about in the 90s. I read way before I was over on the internet, or I even probably knew the internet existed. Reading about in a in a book, you know, in a, in a state library, you know, what I could read about it and, and discovered about these uh, receptors. We only talk about the receptor. <clears throat> And it made so much sense to me. And from then on, I, I always knew you didn't have to have a lot. And you don't have, it doesn't have to be as, you don't need to be, I mean, look, if I had like a big dad, I would fucking pass out. I mean, and I'm like, I'm Wilfred, you know, like, I mean, I've, I'm, people think that, you know, Wilfred, that, and I've been stoner for fucking 25 years, more. Um, but I don't, you don't need to have huge amounts. Um, for you to be able to love it and enjoy it. Because I also still like to function, you know? Still, yeah. I still want to function. Uh, I've got kids, you know? Yep. Um, I mean, and, I mean, and I've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, I agree. And like, there's times where I'll wake and bake because I do that most mornings. It's just part of my uh, morning ritual, if you will. And um, depending on the strain that I'm smoking, will greatly determine how much I smoke because smoking the same amount, right. you know, for each strain, even some that are far less potent, um, 
you know, make me feel obviously much different, um, depending on what it is I'm smoking. So, uh, you know, I'm even, no, I'm, I'm like even, the, I'm, I'm envious. I'm envious. <laughs> look, I, um, I, I look forward to that day. Uh, you know, probably when my kids are teenagers and I can, uh, and I can, but, and also I need to be in California for that. I mean, I, I uh, to get that kind of selection. Um, and I, I look forward to that one day. I just have never in my life, uh, as, as my life has turned out, had a, had a luxury of choice. <laughs> Whatever it is in my life, it always has seemed there's always been like that or, or you're fucked. You know, <laughs> so, uh, and so I was, you know, I, you know, I grew up with, you know, whatever weed that your dealer had was what you smoked, you know, and so um, I just still to this day feel just, you know, like it's just hit and miss. I generally don't have a bad time when I'm high. And you know why? I read this thing. Just let me add some more light to this situation here because my <laughs> lighting here is actually a uh, metal uh, thing. No, that's a bit better. So I read this thing because I did a lot of research into the spirituality of ca cannabis. So I want to know I want to know where it came from. I want to know what planet specifically it was brought from, from what extraterrestrial civilization <laughs> brought to here and given to us, right? So I'm really interested to find out all like the spirituality of it. So I read about this this shaman, this kind of a shaman that said that um or shaman who was going to shaman yeah mm -hmm. and said that uh. Before they have like a kind of a ceremony, they 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 they, they talk to the they, they pray to the cannabis they're about to smoke, and they say, um, "This is what I want from this experience, and I'd love it if you would allow me to have that experience through you." And that the cannabis, plant, and this is what I found, I love this idea, and I believe it. The cannabis plant is like a tool. It's like a bit like a dog in a sense of like, a do what do you want me to do? You want me to bark at you here now and bite you because I don't know what you're fucking doing in my yard? Or do you want me, are you my friend? And so they say that dogs can actually read a person's mind and be able to read what, how they should, they can see the image in your head of what you want, what you want them to be. If you're scared of horses, they'll be scared of you because it's like, well, I don't trust you. You're scared of me, I'm scared of you. But if you've got it in your heart and you go up to a horse and say, hello, beautiful. And I, I did equine therapy as part of like some, some therapy years ago. I know this. To I be remember true. that. You told me that. Yeah. yeah. Well, cannabis is the same. If you're going to have, if you're having a fucking shitty, shitty day, and if you're going to be worrying about, you know, the fight you're having with your, the guy who you work with, who, you know, you're arguing over work, and I think we might end up having a physical fight about this. If you're worried about paranoid or your taxes or whatever it is, you've got worries in your life, and you get high, and you start thinking about those worries, what are they going to do? They're going to get fucking worse. You're going to get paranoid. You're going to have a bad time. But if you go, if you say to that to the, to the cannabis plant that you're about to consume, just before mm -hmm. you have it, respect this is the experience I want to have. Put this in your head. 100% of the time it works. I never, get, I never get paranoid like, oh, why the fuck did I smoke so much and now I forgot I had this phone call or whatever, you know, because I really believe that there's a, spirit, there's a spirituality. It just wants to know what to do. You're the, captain of the, you're the captain of the airplane. It's the airplane. The cannabis is the airplane. And, it, and if you tell it to worry about your taxes, it's going to. If you tell it that you want to have a really cool, relaxing experience and just forget about problems for a while, it will help you do that. And it doesn't matter what strain. That's my thoughts on that. No, I mean, look, you don't have to tell me that. I mean, look, I believe in aliens. I also believe that cannabis is a very, very special plant. Um, where it comes from, I don't know. Is it from this? Is it from this planet? Perhaps, perhaps not. We may never know. Well, you know about the Dogon tribe in uh, in Africa. The Dogon tribe. Dogon tribe. Yeah. Is that is that does that relate to the Dog Star? Yeah, yeah. The, the, it was called the Two Dogs Two Dogs Planet or something. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. They were this African tribe who uh, 
I mean, they don't have any written text, but I've been passing on the history of their civil of, of their of life, right? The first, I mean, the first recorded civilization is the Sumerians, right? Who, who speak of extraterrestrial um, intervention, right? For us to be created from extraterrestrial. But the Dogon history goes back further than that. And they say that this uh, race of beings traveled from the Sirius um, star system and that they traveled here and they, and they brought, they made, us, they, they brought us cannabis. They brought a bunch of other things as well. But cannabis was a big part of it. Well, years back in the 70s, um, some uh, astronomers were talking to some, some researchers and were talking to this tribe and found out that where they said this serious, where this planet came, these beings came from, was actually astronomically accurate. And there's no way they could have possibly known or described that um, constellation had they not had some prior knowledge to it, right? So there was that element. And also people talk about, I mean, you look at these old civilizations, whether it's the uh, Sumerians or whatever, and people talk about it as mythology. And I think that that's a, a misbranding. And, and by calling it mythology, you are assuming that it is false. And I can say with certainty that no human beings are going to spend their time and their, all their energy trying to prank future civilizations. Yeah, this is a prank. Let's just, let's just say we're all fucking aliens, came here, man. No one's going to do that, right? Why would you do that, right? Because we love our children. We want them to do better in life. We want them to do better than us. We're going to, we try to prepare them. We try mm -hmm. to prepare future generations. We build things to help people. We don't prank them. Let's fuck with them and say the whole fucking civilization. Oh, we, they're going to want to know what the fucking truth is, right? So to them, it was the truth. And so if the, if the people at the beginning and that the only ones that left records and say, this is what happened, to me, you got to take it seriously. And I just why I don't call it mythology. Man, you're talking about some some shit now that I could talk uh, about this shit all day, man. I could talk well, about aliens all day. Oh my god, I can't tell you. Uh, so my roommate Derek and Derek, our creative director at Wicked Mortar, he is obsessed with ancient aliens, aliens in yeah, general. Man. And and so you know because we live together, I've also watched all of this with him. He <laughs> bought he bought every season, every episode of every season, oh, ancient great. aliens. Um, Oh, but now he's got this book, Derek. What's the book called? The Secret Teachings of All Ages is this book that he just got. Have you heard of it? I'm you're writing it down. You're writing it down. Good. Um, he's been going. Yeah, yeah, he's been uh, he's been going through that book with a highlighter and sticky notes every night. You know, only thing. I mean, he's he loves that shit. So um, uh, he could definitely talk about that all night long too. <laughs> Well, you know, maybe we'll, maybe we can put a show together because I want to put a show together in this. Uh, I've been I've been developing one, but it's just I mean, how do you make a fucking show these days? I mean, a show also wanted it to be like have an Anthony Bourdain element to it, me traveling around the world, um, you know, in, into some of these locations, trying to find find this find the history of it, you know, like a, a mystery kind of uh, thing. But it's, it's, it's well, we're uh, doing we're, do, we're doing something right we're, do, we're doing something. Remember, so we've got this. Um, high on history show that we're putting together. And we have this sub segment called, instead of calling it conspiracy theories, we're calling it conspiracy series. And so um, we've, uh, you know, I've already told you about high on history. So um, we've, that thing is moving forward very, very quickly. In fact, um, we are actually talking to some networks about it. Um, well, we want to get back to California as soon as we can. My wife wants to get back there. Because the winter's coming here, and the winter in this particular region, which is in north um, north of Spain, Galicia, up above uh, Portugal, is very cold and very wet. So we only got uh, a little while left, and we want we want to get back to California, man. So what's so wait? Uh, how, what's what's preventing you from flying back here already? Is it the COVID thing, or mm, it is? Yeah, it is. It just feels like for me a nervous time right now. America seems like America's got a you know this election coming up. Um, you know, um, I'm like you know when we moved here, you know, I put all my shit in storage. You know, we're renting, 
So, you know, that, all, all our kits and stories in uh, Silmar out in uh, in LA outskirts and but we, when we when we land, I gotta find a house to live in. I gotta, you know, that's hard enough. You have to show shift in the fucking house with two kids and a dog into into another country. Uh, it's fucking hard anytime, man. It's a big deal. And then but to but to be doing it and keeping everyone COVID safe along the way, man, it's a it's it's a big thing. So um we just, you know, for, for, you know, since this whole thing fucking kept happening, you know, my wife's like, when are the, where are the kids going to go to school? Where are we going to live? We even looked at going to Australia then. Mm-hmm. Australia was like COVID free, not anymore. So it's like, well, we don't know what the fuck we're doing, man. Like we're just, you know, we're kind of winging it because there's no playbook really for this thing. That I, I mean, people could say, ah, the plague of 1920 or whatever, but there's no playbook for what is happening right now. So... I've been saying, feel like I've been saying wait and see forever, but um, you know, all it would take for me to, you know, just say bite the bullet and say, okay, we'll give a, we, we're going on this day. Mm-hmm. I mean, it'd be good if there was a, if it'd be good if there was a bit of a, you know, hot, I don't know what's happening with Hollywood, man. I don't know. I don't nothing. Know if it's dead, well, but, nothing. Uh, I mean, everyone's producing COVID-friendly shows, so. You know, there's, and I can tell, I can tell you a little bit more about that offline, but, um, yeah. you know, uh, sure. from, from all of the people that I'm, I mean, Comedy Central, from what I understand is, is, uh, you know, uh, coming, coming apart at its hinges. Uh, they've lost several executives. Um, uh, you know, quite frankly, there's just so many indie OTTs coming out that have great content that honestly, um, a lot of these bigger networks are finding it very difficult to compete with because they're taking away, you know, ad revenue. Yeah. Well, um, but that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. All right. All right, brother. Well, Hey, I, dude, I appreciate you coming on my show. Um, it has been an honor and a pleasure again. Uh, thanks for telling, you know, everyone else that, you know, hasn't heard of you, doesn't know of you, but now does, or he hasn't heard of your brand, but knows of, you know, the Wilford show. Um, thanks for sharing uh, a bit about, you know, the brand as it relates to your past, um, your present and the future of, you know, what you see yourself doing personally and that of the cannabis industry. Um, and more importantly, man, I'm, I'm proud of you and I'm excited for you. And uh, yeah, and thank you everyone for, you know, tuning in. Um, you know, this is Jason Gann, uh, Jared Mirsky, and we're um, signing out. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. then, hey, well, before you go. Well, wait, on at, Wil- at Wilford on Instagram. At Wilford, at Wilford on Instagram. Yep, That's Wilford at Instagram. WilfordCannabis.com. WilfordCannabis.com cool. at Wilford at Instagram. Perfect. We'll include all, all the links everyone. in the bios. People love watch me. Um, dude, I love you, bro. I appreciate you. And I'm excited for us to start working together. So yeah, let's talk soon. All right, brother. Bye.